I think robotics has had a massive amount of success in industrial and manufacturing setting. But for a while now, we've talked about robotics as everything that it could do. And I think people want to finally see some result. I think aside from like maybe your vacuum clean at home. In this episode, I talked to Vincent Beda, who studied mechanical engineering at ETH Zurich and now lives in San Francisco, currently the technical product manager at Nimble Robotics. This is the We Are ETH podcast, and I am Susan Kish, the host. Vincent, how did you get interested in robotics? Did you play with a lot of Legos when you were small? What was the trigger for this? Actually, yeah, I did Lego a lot. And I always was fascinated with creating my own thing, like being very hands-on in building something. ETH, I remember driving by as a kid that building and since forever being like, this is where I'll go one, at one point in my life in order to learn how to build those things. There has always been a dream to do this. And did you grow up in Zurich? I did, yes. I moved from the French part, uh, as my name might suggest. Uh, I moved from the French part of Switzerland when I was around three years old. And then I grew up my whole life in Zurich. So ETH was always in your destiny. I'm trying to imitate the voices from Star Wars in your destiny. (laughs) ETH was always going to be there? Yes, always. Uh, I think that was... Or the plan and the beautiful execution afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You got a bachelor and master's in mechanical engineering and finished. What was it like to graduate or to go to school there in the 2010s? It was very interesting coming in a space where technically I had to dig so much deeper than I ever had before, having people around me that were pushing me to really, yeah, go into the most technical things that I ever had to. What's an example? What do you, when you say technical things, that feels like sort of a pretty broad brush. So help me understand this. When you go to high school, a lot of people that would go to ETH maybe had an easier time with math and physics and stuff like that. Whereas when you go to ETH, those people around you are all absolutely brilliant in those fields. And so you're doing the basic math from high school is long over and you really have to go into the mechanics, the physics, understand core concepts to a higher level. And yeah, having those people around you that for whom this can be (laughs) self-explanatory was a big push. And like, it's an environment that is very much about learning together. Whereas there are a lot of other like universities where it's about competing about who has the best grades and stuff like that, I always felt like ETH was different in that way. Uh, It was supporting each other. So what was the hardest thing you studied? The hardest thing I studied? Oh, don't tell me everything was easy. (laughs) I mean, no, no, I'm really literally trying to think of the (laughs) hardest since a lot of things were hard. (laughs) I was always more into mechanics and like the real kind of how do I use this knowledge to build things. Uh I think the physics and more the theoretical aspects of physics was always a little bit harder for me. And I think for me, it's always a lot that comes with interest. The more I'm interested in a subject, the easier it is. That just means you're human, Vincent. Fair enough. (laughs) What's the first thing you built? The first thing I think that I built was probably a rocket for my high school matura. Uh-huh. I built a, I think it was about two meter, a rocket that, that would fly up into the sky. And then I remember correctly, it was around two, three hundred meters, at which point it would split the come back with the parachutes. Yeah, that was one of the first bigger. That sounds cool. And did you actually have it take off and do the yeah, whole yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, really? did the whole thing. Yeah. I Unfortunately, I cannot find the video again. I think I lost the video. It was such a good moment. Good. And what kinds of stuff did you build while you were at the ETH? During ETH, so during my bachelor's thesis, I started experimenting with some quick prototyping, 3D cutting to create some very like simple mechanism, but built with new manufacturing methods. And then during my master's thesis, I was working on the foot of the animal robot. It was a prototype at the time at Marco Hooters Labs. 
for my internship, I worked on a robotic exoskeleton that a human uh-huh. could wear and remotely control a robotic arm. There's lots of things that fascinate me around that field. So you finished your master's, and then what did you decide to do? And then I wanted to continue with this very hands-on approach, and I thought that the best thing to do would be a startup. Uh-huh. I think with the idea of I want to build my own thing, that not only translated to like mechanical, but also to business and wanting to be very much part of building up a business. So I was looking for a startup and I found one in Germany called Synapticon, yeah. which was perfect. A startup was in robotics, was a pretty small company. Personally, I feel like in a small company, a person can have a bigger impact, can, ha- can have more freedom in like exploring. And I thought that was a perfect first role after, after my master. And so was Synapticon involved in robotics? They were, yes. They were. So they are building the the controller, basically the electronics that control electric motors that are present in every robot. And those motors have to be controlled with a very high precision and often with a minimizing technology where you want that electronic to be as small as possible. They build this and as a mechanical engineer, I was mostly in charge of how to integrate that hardware into uh, multiple different applications and basically help customers by make, doing the first step and showing, hey, like this is how you could do it and this would help so much with your application. Okay, so that sounds like great fun, but clearly you left. So what was the catalyst and what did you decide to do next? Yeah, I was really having fun with as an engineer, but slowly was getting more and more into a project management mode. And I did really like this. It's, again, about building up something. And instead of building up a, a robot, I was trying to build up more of the business around everything. But I felt like I needed something more educational-wise and therefore applied for MBAs in the U.S. And yeah, I got accepted at MIT Sloan, which was amazing. It's a great school. Plus, there's a real ecosystem of robotic startups and spin-outs around greater Boston, right? Absolutely. What was different if you had to compare and contrast classes at the ETH and classes at Sloan and MIT? What was what were the big differences? Yeah, I think it was much more also because of the field. I think much more conversational, much more mm-hmm. about debates and I think engineering often is one true solution. There's no multiple ways to think of, (laughs) that's the formula, that's how it works, apply it. Whereas maybe with an MBA, there are more classes where you have, you can have discussions and there's no absolute right answer. The MBA is, a lot of it, as people say, is about connecting and like, you know, getting to know the people. But I do feel like this is something that we can really bring also to ETH in a further level. And I think ETH Circle is exactly what I was looking for. Like being able to meet people from ETH and from different years of ETH is super interesting. We are going to put ETH Circle to the side because I'd love to dig into that more. But one final question about MIT and, and coming to Sloan. If you had to give advice to somebody who just finished there, just as you did, an undergraduate and then a master's degree, and they were looking to come study in the States, what pieces of advice would you give them to prepare them to do well at an institution like that? A lot of it's going to be like experience, the diversity of culture, and like be very open. Go and meet people, come in with a very open mind in order to be able to really get as much as possible out of studying in a different country that has famously like a a very high diversity. So I think open-minded and with a willingness to get to know people. I think that's what I took a lot from. And it also sounds like put a value to the diversity of people and experiences. Correct. Yes. It's, I think those, that led to so many interesting discussions to talk about how do you do things in the US? How did you use to do it back in Europe? How do you do it across the world? And so getting those learnings and trying to like, you know, oversect on like, oh, those are the things that we are both do the same and it really works well. Or like you do those two things differently and you get different impacts from it. I think those interesting those discussions are super interesting. So not everybody who's listening to the podcast may know what the ETH circle is. So can you explain what it is first and then let's talk about that for a while. For me, ETH Circle is really a place where we can get back to meeting fellow 
students that studied at ETH that valued their experience at ETH and want to continue like sharing this value further. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what ETH Circle represents for me. I also think there's a mission there to continue to spread that value and to bring those people together that studied there to continue supporting each other, which should be a big part of an alumni organization, in my opinion, is to help each other out. Do you have any specific ideas on things that ETH Circle can do or examples of how ETH Circle made a difference? The example that also made me want to join was that the one of the first dinners that we had that was in Boston, actually. And I met with, I think there were about 20, 25 people from ETH. I think around half of them were local to Boston. And I was able to meet people from all sorts of different industry in one evening and have the very interesting discussions at that point. And it's enriching, I think, in one's life to have those discussions and those uh, people to talk to. Let's go back to the question about robotics. The world is full of headlines about next generation robotics and where that field is going. I just saw a video where ChatGPT got loaded into a robot at, I think it was at iRobots, right? So the robot could talk and answer questions and follow commands. What are the next big challenges around robotics? Where do you see that field going? I think robotics has had like a massive amount of success in 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 industrial kind of manufacturing setting. But for a while now, we've talked about robotics as like everything that it could do. And I think people want to finally see some result. I think aside from like maybe your vacuum cleaner at home. I love rob- my little <laughs> vacuum cleaner. Can they I are just incredibly say? helpful. It's <laughs> right next to me. And oh my God, I definitely needed it. But I want to see more, like, I, I think more people have to also focus on what are the real applications that we can actually hit in the next five years. There's been more and more, theoretically, you could have this robot that cleans the dishes for you and all of those things. Sounds good. It sounds amazing, but I do think there's, like, those closer, lower-hanging fruits to catch mm-hmm. where robotics could have a big impact for society. Where do you see tangible things that can make a difference in that five-year time frame? I'm already looking out the window and I regularly see, for example, autonomous cars. Those are, in in a sense, like very much robotics. And I do think robotics like that is definitely much closer to getting fruition versus, for example, like direct-to-customer robotics, like Mm -hmm. for somebody to use at home. That always comes with a lot more challenges. Okay. So you see, because you must live in San Francisco, because that's the only place I know with autonomous vehicles going around. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so you see applications in transportation. You mentioned already manufacturing. Those are those huge robots that put cars together and stuff like that. Correct. Right? Warehousing. Where, and <laughs> yeah. in warehouses, how do they use robots in warehouses? Um, I, a lot of people know Amazon and Amazon, I bought that Kiva solution. And Kiva actually was an invention that also a professor from ETH actually worked on. Indirectly, uh, it's a professor from ATH that actually provided the robotic solution for Amazon. There's a ton of warehousing solution around robotics that is exploding right now in order to increase that labor efficiency. Ah, so machines that can somehow scan and then pick up and put into boxes or scan and sort or that kind of stuff? That can help, exactly. That can help basically humans be more efficient and to increase like how the goods come and get out of a warehouse faster. Got it. I've often wondered about some of the prosthetics. You talked about working in exoskeletons. And there also seems to be an intersection between robots and that kind of work. Where do you see that going? The advancements there have been amazing. I've seen quite a few videos of more and more popping out around some active robotics. So that means with motors, but also just some passive mechanics that make walking so much easier when you have a prosthetic leg and like nearly invisible to see the difference with or without. So I think there's a lot of solution there. But again, I'm wondering if a passive, just purely mechanical, which is also one of this beauty, if you can solve something purely mechanically, could be a solution as well. So like mechanical watches are still like something that I found beautiful. Like it's purely mechanics. And I know that there are battery powered ones that might be much simpler But if you can solve it with mechanics, you can have some big advantages as well. There is this interesting intersection with artificial intelligence and robotics. Can you talk about that? 
Yes, I think ChatGPT has refocused everyone on what mm-hmm. AI can do. I feel like there was a lot, of, like there was starting to be kind of a dip where everybody was talking about AI, but there was you like... figure what the of, hell it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was a question like, okay, apparently AI is a big new thing, but... But what is it? What is it doing? <laughs> yeah, what is it doing for me? Yeah. <laughs> and I think ChatGPT kind of brought back the public eye t- uh, to what is possible and... Robotics for sure is going to be a field where more and more of this will be applied. I've seen a startup of a, actually also a ETH colleague, how do you call it? Preventive maintenance, I think. So basically it's not even that robotics, but it's a sensor that you would basically place on a machine. Yeah. And with AI, you could over time learn the patterns of vibration or the sound of the machines and then learn when that machine sounds too like be close to breaking and then repair it before it actually breaks. Ah, so maintenance not on a schedule of doing it every three months, but maintenance when it's needed or just before it's needed. Correct. And huh. I think everybody think when we say robotics, a lot of people think of the arm, like the arm robot. And I think right. there's a lot of application like like those which are like close to robotics that are like very accessible by AI now. And those will be the things that will start to boom. Yeah. A, a lot. Very, very cool. So you live in San Francisco. Yep. How do you like Northern California? And are you going to be staying there for a long time? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really enjoy it here. It's the, at least like the nature reminds me very much of Switzerland in the sense of it's very close. Huh. Like it's, I can get out of San Francisco in, in 15 minutes and be very much in, in the hills. So that aspect uh, is amazing. I have uh, quite a few friends that were studying with me at, at Boston that came to SF. So I think the only bigger negatives here is that it's even further away from Switzerland than Boston. So the trip back is right. long. Right. And the time zone change. The time zone makes it tough. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but, no, uh, absolutely you live true. To live. Got it. Any plans to return to Zurich? Not yet. I think I'll stay here as long as I feel like this is the place where I can make the bigger, the biggest changes, the biggest innovations. And uh, yeah, eventually, maybe back to Switzerland, but no plans yet. Well, thank you. And thank you, Vincent, so much for your time. This is a great conversation. Really appreciate it. I'd like to close with asking a few questions that we usually ask the folks who are guests. And the first one is, if you're in Zurich or at the ETH, what's your favorite place to go? I think right now I would think of just home. <laughs> uh-huh. I know it's it may be a bit simple, but it's been a while. So for me, the home I grew up in represents like seeing family again. And I, I always was having a lot of friends over. So it just means seeing friends and family again. That's lovely. And when you were growing up, other than knowing that you wanted to go to the ETH... What did you want to be when you grew up? I always wanted to be an inventor. That's how I like as a kid. Exactly. As a kid, I was always saying, I want to be an inventor. And you are. I I feel like I'm (laughs) the most inventorish I can can be (laughs) at this point. And finally, what are you curious about now? What are you learning? What are the books on your bookshelf by your bed? Or what's on your Kindle or whatever? Or podcasts you listen to? I'm... Learning more about AI, I think Mm -hmm. seeing its real application and not as like what it could eventually do is making me realize what it can do. And then I think continuing to connect engineering with business and finding those cross sections has become more and more something I'm interested in. Not doing engineering for engineering's sake, but actually Mm -hmm. engineering that has a purpose can help, whether it's a business or even if it's just a, a nonprofit, like that kind of thinking is a mindset that in engineering school we don't necessarily have. We are learning how to engineer. We're not necessarily how to think through what can I engineer that's going to be like. And make a difference. Exactly, exactly. Well, Vincent, thank you very much again. Delighted to have you here. I look forward to seeing you at an ETH circle. I'm Susan Kish, host of the We Are ETH series, telling the story of the alumni and friends of the ETH Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. ETH regularly ranks amongst the top universities of the world in terms of cutting-edge research, science, and people. The people who were there, the people who are there, and the people who will be there. Please subscribe to this podcast, join us wherever you listen, and give us a good rating. 
on Spotify or Apple if you enjoyed today's conversation. I'd like to thank our producers at LE Media and ETH Circle, and to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today.